It is a great pleasure to uh, welcome Susan Shirk back to Princeton. And when I say back to Princeton, I mean it because Susan was one of the very first uh, woman undergraduate students at this university. In 1965-66, uh, she was part of the Critical Language, Languages program, uh, studying Chinese over in Jones Hall with, uh, as she's just told me, Fritz Mo Chan Da Duan, uh, uh, Liu Zijian, and various people, uh, including Marion J. Levy, Jr., although she wasn't studying Chinese with him, uh, who are uh, major figures from Princeton's past. And some of the people in the room uh, will recognize them and their names. Uh, this was a kind of study abroad program in New Jersey uh, that she was on, because uh, Susan was a, uh, a student at Mount Holyoke College uh, when she has just come, uh, today I guess, or, uh, and because Princeton didn't yet have the wisdom to uh, have undergraduate women uh, receive BAs, uh, she, she graduated from Mount Holyoke, then went up uh, to the University of California at Berkeley and got an MA in Asian Studies, uh, then a PhD from MIT in Political Science. Uh, now. Uh, Susan Church is a professor of political science at the University of California at San Diego, uh, but also she directs on a system, a University of California system-wide basis, uh, the Institute for Global Conflict and Cooperation. Uh, she first traveled to China in 1971. We both at that point were writing our PhD theses in a uh, small house on uh, Argyle Street in Kowloon, because one couldn't really do much research in China then. Um, from 1997 to 2000, uh, Susan served under President Bill Clinton as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, the job that our uh, colleague here, Tom Christensen, currently has. Uh, and she has been very active as a public intellectual uh, on China issues. She's founded and uh, in the early 90s and leads the Northeast Asia Cooperation Dialogue which is a kind of uh, unofficial track two uh, organization uh, that incorporates academics and uh, officials uh, from a variety of Asian countries, the US and China, but also Russia, Japan, and both Koreas. And her publications are many, I will, will uh, just mention some titles, <coughs> partly because the first one, uh, Competitive Comrades, is such a nice title. Uh, also, How China Opened Its Door, a book on uh, foreign investment and trade. The Political Logic of Economic Reform in China, uh, whose chapter on decision rules is one of the things that I uh, ask everybody in graduate seminars and undergraduate courses on China to read. And her latest book, uh, this one, uh, also up on the screen there, China, a Fragile Superpower, published by Oxford University Press just last year. Uh, which is also the title of her talk. Uh, will you help me welcome Susan Shirk back to Princeton? Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor White. It's a real treat to be back here with you at Princeton. Um, you know, uh, I find it slightly easier to find the ladies' rooms now than it was then. Uh, so things really have improved a lot. Um, but that was a very interesting time. I like to describe it as my junior year as a bra at Princeton. Uh, I, was, I was one of 12 female undergraduates at Princeton that year, and it's been downhill ever since, really. Um, I also want to just take this opportunity because I know there are quite a few undergraduates here to say I teach at the Graduate School of International Relations Pacific Studies at UC San Diego. This is the only professional international affairs school focusing on Asia and Latin America. We have an amazing faculty and go online, check it out because we're keen to have uh, good students, and I know you're getting wonderful training here at Princeton. So, um, 
Okay, no more advertisements. <laughs> now, uh, this is a very young Susan Shirk, uh, only a few years after being here at Princeton uh, with Joe and Lai. I am a China scholar, as Professor White said, who has been visiting China since 71. And I did have this unusual opportunity to serve in government in the Clinton administration. And it really, it was that experience serving in government that um, convinced me that when I came back to the university, I wanted to write a book for a broader audience, not um, uh, an academic book of the sort that I had written before. And uh, I went to Washington in 1997 uh, very worried about the possibility of a war, a shooting war, between China and the United States. That's because in the previous year, in 1996, China and America had come into an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation over the island of Taiwan that Beijing claims is part of China, but which has ruled itself independently since 1949. The Chinese launched massive military exercises and missile tests outside two Taiwan ports in order to express their fury that the United States had allowed Taiwan President Li Deng Hui to visit his alma mater, Cornell, and to make a speech there, which in the eyes of uh, the mainland signified that we were recognizing Taiwan as a sovereign, independent state. So uh, they expressed their fury through these military, intimidating military actions. The United States responded by sending two carrier battle groups to the vicinity of Taiwan and Beijing back down. But what would happen the next time? Uh, Crisis escalation has a life all its own, and many wars occur, even if no one wants them to happen. As I worked to improve U.S.-China relations while I was in the State Department, I kept noticing how focused China's leaders seemed to be on their own domestic politics, and how politically insecure they seemed. Now, let's, this was the Clinton administration, so let's remember I was getting a pretty heavy dose of domestic politics on our side, too, uh, related to U.S. policy toward China. I'm sure you'll remember the accusations that the Clinton White House was accepting campaign contributions from the Chinese and that had uh, allowed nuclear and uh, satellite secrets to be transferred to China. But you know, in China, there's so much more at stake for Chinese politicians than there is for American politicians. In America, it's just a matter of winning the next election. But for Chinese politicians, it's about the survival of Communist Party rule. And if the party falls, of course, they and their families lose everything. You know, as I was writing this book, <coughs> I would tell my American friends that I was writing a book about domestic politics and foreign policy in China called Fragile Superpower, and they would usually say, hmm, what do you mean fragile? They were puzzled by that. But when I was writing the book, I would give a heads up to my Chinese friends, because I didn't want them to be blindsided. Uh, about the book, and I told them, I'm writing this book called China Fragile Superpower. Every single one of them said, what do you mean, superpower? <laughs> now, what's interesting about that is not just that they do not view China as that strong uh, and international player yet. They're very aware of China's weaknesses. But even more telling is that not one of them questioned the premise that China is domestically fragile. Now this fragility came through the most clearly to me in a very traumatic experience I had when I was in government. 
One evening in May 1999, I was on my way home from the State Department when I got a call from the op center at the State Department telling me that the Chinese embassy in Belgrade had been struck by a U.S. bomber flying as part of a NATO mission in Yugoslavia. Now, I assumed it's a stray fragment, collateral damage, but I soon learned that no, in fact, we had mistakenly targeted this building, believing that it was a Yugoslav military facility when it was the Chinese embassy. So we had struck it directly with our bombs, killed three Chinese journalists, and interviewed 20 other Chinese who were in the building. Well, as, uh, and there are the journalists. Now, as I turned around and went back to the State Department to coordinate our response, my first instinct was that we would have to apologize profusely from the president on down. Because if we didn't apologize adequately, then the Chinese would never let us forget it, just as they have never let the Japanese forget their failure to apologize adequately for the atrocities they committed in China during their occupation uh, of China during World, World War II. So we had President Clinton call President Jiang Zemin to apologize. Jiang Zemin wouldn't accept the call. We had Secretary Albright go to the Chinese embassy to apologize that night. We, had, uh, we tried to send a special envoy right away. The Chinese said, don't come. We had President Clinton sign the condolence book from the Chinese embassy. Uh, finally, President Clinton kept trying to call President Zhang, and finally he did accept the call. Um, and Clinton, therefore, could apologize again. We had him apologize on television, as you see there. So he apologized at least three times. Uh, and Secretary Albright and other senior officials did as well. And we paid compensation for the losses that the victims suffered and for the loss of the building. But all our efforts were in vain. Uh, soon, protesters were swarming into the streets in Beijing and the other cities where the U.S. has consulates. Uh, and the Chinese <coughs> Communist Party had told people following the incident that it was a brazen and intentional act, is what they said in the media. And they also arranged buses so that the students could go to the U.S. missions where they threw rocks and bricks and Molotov cocktails, although the uh, police would not allow them to enter the building, but they did stand by and allow them to trash the building. So what was going on here? What explains the reactions of uh, the Chinese leaders? Well, first of all, I think you've got to put yourself in the shoes of President Jiang Zemin and the other Chinese leaders. And that's what I try to do in my book. You know, Secretary Albright uh, taught me that you can never get anywhere diplomatically in, until you could put yourself in the shoes of that person facing you across the table. And I think that's what Americans also need to think about when they're uh, dealing with China. So how, why did Jiang Zemin and his colleagues react this way to the Belgrade embassy bombing? Well, let's look at the timing, first of all. Uh, the incident occurred in early May. And just a few weeks before, in April, uh, Jiang Zemin and other Chinese leaders had awakened one morning to find themselves surrounded by 10,000 adherents of the Falun Gong, a spiritual sect that was demonstrating peacefully in order to demand that they be recognized as a legitimate organization. Well, needless to say, Jiang Zemin and other Chinese leaders were very alarmed that this group using cell phones and internet 
without any warning from the public security, had managed to organize this peaceful process, uh, protest surrounding Zhongnanhai, where Chinese leaders work and many of them live. And I have been told by uh, several insiders that the night of the Belgrade Embassy bombing, Jiang Zemin stayed up late writing a long memo not on how to handle the crisis with the United States over the embassy bombing, but on how to crush the Falun Gong organization. And I speculate that in his somewhat paranoid thinking, <coughs> these two threats merged together. In thinking about the timing, it's also very relevant that just uh, less than a month after the Belgrade Embassy bombing was going to be June 4th, 1999. I'm sure many of you recognize the significance of that day. It was the 10th anniversary of Tiananmen, the pro-democracy protests that had occurred in Beijing and more than 130 other cities throughout China that had brought the uh, Communist Party rule really into a very perilous state and the fact that it was going to be the 10th anniversary uh, led the leaders to worry that the students who most likely, and they probably knew this through intelligence, were organizing demonstrations on the occasion of the 10th anniversary because in China anniversaries are often the occasion for mass protests that the students would just sort of take their organization and move it up a few weeks. And so they would find uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of students going into Tiananmen Square or, or coming to Zhongnanhai to uh, accusing the Chinese government of being so weak, so feckless in the face of the United States that Washington would feel they could bomb the Chinese embassy without worrying about retaliation. And uh, that, therefore, I believe, explains the buses. The buses were there to make sure that the students went to the US embassies and missions, not to Tiananmen or to Zhongnanhai. So what are the implications of that? The implications are that China's leaders were willing to risk a confrontation with the United States in order to protect themselves from domestic opposition. So based on this traumatic experience and other experiences I had in government that weren't nearly as traumatic but seemed to show a clear pattern, a pattern of China's leaders really being very anxious about their hold on power inside China and that this insecurity drives their actions and decisions both in regard to foreign policy as well as in regard to domestic policy. You know, to us outside China, China's leaders look like giants because the country has been so dramatically successful economically and um, becoming a modern military and increasing its influence in the world. But in their own minds, I think they feel more like scared children uh, trying to stay on top of this society that has been turned upside down as a result of the market reforms and opening to the world that China has experienced since 1978. So, question I'd like to focus on today is why are China's leaders so insecure? If the country has been so successful, and certainly China doesn't confront any serious international threats now, so what's the source of this political insecurity? To answer the question, we need to go back to 1989. In that year, the regime was shaken to its roots by the student demonstrations that occurred 
in more than 130 cities throughout China. And the fact that the leadership divided, split over how to handle the protests. That's very important because if those two things go together, you're really in trouble. And the PRC survived really only because the military remained loyal and followed Deng Xiaoping's orders to come in and forcibly put down the demonstrations. So ever since that close call in 1989 and the collapse of communism, which began in just the very same time. Remember that the Berlin Wall fell in November of 1989. So it's hardly a surprise that China's leaders ever since that decisive year worry that their own days in power are numbered. China's leaders of today also know that they lack the prestige and personal following of a Mao Zedong or a Deng Xiaoping. People like Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin, who are pictured at the bottom here, basically are colorless technocrats, organization men. Pretty much all these leaders are interchangeable with one another. There's nothing really very uh, distinctive about them. Uh, and they don't have much charisma, even though they try to make it look as if they do. <laughs> they also recognize that two decades, two and a half decades of economic reform and opening to the world have really just so drastically transformed Chinese society. Now, I'm just going to whiz through this because we all know the story of China's dramatic successful economic miracle. Uh, growth rates at over 10% a year for 25 years. Per capita income increasing at more than 8% per year, which is absolutely unprecedented in world history, that you would have that rapid increase in per capita income over such a long period. Of course, China remains a very poor country in per capita income terms, but it's just a dramatically changed place from the pre-opening, pre-market reform era. Um, and so the party really can no longer keep track of the population, much less control it. About 150 or 200 people have, from the countryside have moved to the cities. Chinese people are on the move now. <coughs> this is a very dramatic exodus of, from the countryside of urbanization. Uh, three quarters of the workforce are employed outside the state sector where there is very little political supervision and tens of millions of people have uh, traveled abroad every year. And here's something I think is really important, and that is that people in China now have so much more information than they used to about what's going on in Tokyo or Taipei or Washington, um, as well as in their own country. Uh, you know, I, this, this uh, graph I would, should really be uh, revising on a daily basis. I think the number now is 200 million approximately 200 million people get their news through the internet, including virtually everyone who's ever had a college education. But it's not just the internet. It's also these tabloid newspapers that are published throughout China and that admittedly are still censored. But these newspapers have, and cable television networks have strong market incentives to um, write exciting stories that will attract readers and viewers. So they've got every incentive to push the limits of censorship. Um, and as a result, it's virtually impossible, despite a lot of efforts to maintain control over the media and the internet, it's basically impossible to prevent 
people from knowing what is happening outside of China or even in other parts of the country. So of course that uh, contributes to the insecurity of China's leaders and the worry that this kind of new increased flow of information will lead to collective action protest activity. China's leaders are also really obsessed almost with the problem of inequality in China. Uh, you know, we talk a lot in this country about our wealth gap, which now is larger than it's been in more than a century. But China's is worse. Uh, using the Gini coefficient, which is the internationally accepted measure of income inequality with zero being perfect equality, China's Gini coefficient is about 0.49. And America's is now a little more than 0.41, but still less than 0.49. China's leaders talk and publish articles constantly about this, uh, their worries about inequality, polarization, they call it. And they worry that it could spark major political uh, unrest. Now, why are they so worried about inequality? I think it's because it's widely believed in China that the wealthy, this new conspicuously consuming rich class, has acquired its wealth not through ingenuity, hard work, diligence, but through official corruption. And that's what makes this inequality so potentially explosive in political terms. And of course, there still are uh, tens and millions of people who still live in grinding poverty. Now, this generation of Chinese leaders, this administration is trying to stave off unrest using what I might call uh, kind of compassionate communism. I find it kind of ironic that now the Communist Party has to work so hard to demonstrate that they care about the poor. You know, that's not uh, Mao's Communist Party. Uh, so they work very hard adopting a slogan called harmonious society, building a harmonious society, to demonstrate and to put into place policies that will help the have-nots, the people who have not benefited as much from China's economic miracle. Um, and President, I mean, Premier Wen Jiabao, who's pictured here, he's very effective media politician He's on television at least once a week, uh, going down to visit with some poor <coughs> farmers who've suffered a natural or man-made disaster. And he puts his arm around the farmers and he kind of tears up, showing his great empathy, a little bit like a Chinese Bill Clinton, I think. <laughs> and he's very effective at this. Um, and people really do believe that he feels the pain of the poor farmers in China. But despite all of these efforts that the current leaders have exerted to show, to demonstrate that they care about the have-nots, there still are very frequent protests throughout China, um, in the cities and in the countryside. And these are laid off workers, uh, in the cities or sometimes um, migrants who are angry at uh, some rich folks who've hit a poor peddler with a car, big BMW, or recently in the countryside, a lot of demonstrations having to do with land requisitions where the farmers have not been compensated adequately, and also and this is really interesting, China's severe environmental problems <coughs> have been triggering a lot of 
protest activity, people are really upset about pollution in the water, especially poisoning their children, runoff from chemical factories, and <coughs> this, this sort of thing. Now, the party leaders are very worried about social unrest, and they make no secret of their insecurity. This is not just something that you need to, that we're projecting onto them like they should be worried. Their fears are very transparent. They talk about it all the time. And here they said, you know, a party status as a party in power does not necessarily last as long as the party does. The party could fall. That's uh, Wen Jiabao says, to think about why danger looms will ensure one's security. To think about why chaos occurs will ensure one's peace. To think about why a country falls will ensure one's survival. So it's really an open secret that China's leaders are that insecure. Uh, they, we see this term, Xiuhui Wen Ding, social stability, appearing with increasing frequency over the 1990s especially. And that's a, a kind of a euphemism that the party uses to convince people that if you didn't have the party in charge, that China would experience severe instability, fall apart into chaos, and perhaps even civil war. And you see, we saw recently, just last month, when China experienced this natural disaster of massive um, snowstorms throughout China, just at a time that people were uh, getting ready to take the train and to travel back to their homes to visit their families over Chinese New Year. Well, this could have been the spark that uh, uh, led to massive protest activity, and the leaders were not sure whether or not those hundreds of thousands of people crammed into the Guangzhou railway station were going to blame the weather or blame the government. And so Wen Jiabao ran around making a lot of televised speeches, uh, asking people to be patient, and even apologizing, which is interesting because it's as if he did accept that the government and not just the weather was responsible for the problems. But, he, but clearly the leadership was very nervous about making sure that this natural disaster didn't, uh, didn't uh, stimulate uh, major opposition to uh, the party and the government. But protests are not the only thing <coughs> that China's leaders worry about. The lessons that they took away from the Tiananmen crisis were that in addition to preventing massive unrest, you also need to prevent public leadership splits, such as you had during the Tiananmen crisis. Because if the leadership is clearly divided, this will embolden people to come out and protest. It might even embolden a leader to reach out beyond the elite politics to mobilize support. So that's a very dangerous situation. As a result, they do everything they can to try to maintain a public face of unanimity at the top. Now, doing this is particularly difficult during a succession uh, contest because it's when you have to choose the new leaders. Oh, why does it do that? Um, it's really odd how it works when I do it on my computer, but it doesn't work here. But anyway, don't worry about it. Um, this, uh, let me see if I can go back. It's a previous. Where is that? A previous second line. That this oh, yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, 
At the 17th Party Congress in the fall of this year, um, they had to pick a new leadership group, a new standing committee of the Politburo. And also, they had to pick a successor to Hu Jintao, because although he has another five-year term ahead of him, he won't step down until 2012. By precedent, you should really pick a leader now to be readied for a smooth transition five years from now. So maintaining a public face of unanimity, not revealing the divisions which must inevitably occur because of the intense competition during this succession period is very difficult. And um, we had uh, quite a few retirements from the Standing Committee of the Politburo, and then we had four, ooh, that looks weird, four, um, four younger leaders move up, and I must say I am impressed with the ability of the oligarchy to maintain uh, this public face of unanimity while choosing a successor. It does appear that Xi Jinping has been uh, chosen as a successor to Hu Jintao. What's really interesting about that is to keep the oligarchy together, Xi Jinping, the choice, was not the person Hu Jintao would have chosen. It wasn't his personal choice. His personal choice, Li Keqiang, had to settle for premier. And many people in China believe that this is not a done deal. That uh, the, there are a number of, including the two other guys who were promoted, that there are other members of the so-called fifth generation who may challenge them in 2012. And of course, if you have those kind of challenges, it will be very difficult to prevent any public leadership splits. Finally, there's the military. This is the third lesson of Tiananmen. You've got to keep the military loyal to the party and, in fact, to the individual number one leader. Uh, because if you've got a lot of protests, if the leadership splits, then the last line of defense is the support of the military. So uh, it, no wonder Hu Jintao devotes a lot of time and effort to cultivating the support of the military. And I think this domestic incentive to keep the military loyal to the party leadership helps us understand why the military has enjoyed double-digit increases in the defense budget over the past 15 years. My own view is it's not just Taiwan, it's not just international influences, but this domestic uh, rationale, this domestic reason is also important. Finally, let me touch on the question of nationalism. You know, uh, the growth of popular nationalism in China over the past uh, 20 years or so is something that both works for China's leaders in helping bolster their power and that they have stimulated, especially during the 90s under Jiang Zemin. But it's also something they worry about, that it could go too far. And that's because the previous two dynasties, the, uh, the Qing dynasty that uh, fell in 1911 to the Republican government and to the Republican uh, government that fell to the communists in 1949. If you step back, you see that both of them were brought down by national movements in which the very specific discontents associated with different <laughs> urban and rural groups were fused together by the powerful force of nationalism, which is sort of the one banner that can help unify groups with a lot of very specific complaints. Um, and certainly, today's leaders 
worry that the same thing could happen to them, that they could be accused of being too weak in the face of foreign pressure like the two previous dynasties were. Nationalist emotions are focused primarily on three hot button issues. These are foreign policy issues, but they're issues that become domestic policy, policy issues. United States, Japan, and Taiwan. And the, of those three hot button issues of Chinese nationalism, the one that certainly arouses the strongest emotion is Japan. And we saw that emotion very visibly in April of 2005, when there were anti-Japanese demonstrations in about 30 cities uh, in China. Um, and that was uh, the largest set of demonstrations since Tiananmen. So the question is then, how does this insecurity that China's leaders feel because of the various reasons I've described, especially the fact that they just look out their window and they see a society that is so transformed and very difficult for Communist Party to maintain control of. Um, and rising nationalism, et cetera. So what are the consequences of this domestic insecurity for China's international behavior? You know, I really believe China's leaders when they say that they want to rise peacefully they want the country to demonstrate that it's a responsible power uh, that is not eager to pick fights with the United States or Japan or any other country. I, I believe they're really very sincere in that intention. But the question I have is, will they be able to sustain it domestically in the face of increasing mass protests, intensifying nationalism, and the fact that people have so much more information about what's going on in Tokyo, Taipei, and Washington. We need to be aware of China's fragility when we make our own policies toward China. Everything America say, Americans say and do toward China then reverberates through Chinese domestic politics. By keeping in mind how our, um, our words and actions resonate inside China, Americans can enable China's leaders to uh, act like the responsible power they claim China is, rather than behaving aggressively in reaction to their own domestic predicament. So uh, I end my book with some advice for American policymakers as to once you recognize China's domestic fragility, how that should uh, influence your policy. And I'm quite free with my advice to Chinese leaders as well. Um, and so we can talk about that or anything else you would like to discuss um, uh, now. So thanks so much for listening so attentively. <laughs>Uh, the good news is that it's question period. Uh, the bad news is that um, Professor Shirk has to leave at 6 o'clock because she is uh, catching a plane to California to give another speech um, tomorrow morning uh, in Los Angeles. And there are uh, also there are a lot of people here. Um, I thank Dale Satin for moving this event from uh, our, our co-sponsor with the China and the World program for moving this event uh, from a smaller bowl downstairs to, uh, to this place where even in midterm week at 4.30 uh, the, the seats fill. Uh, so we need uh, really a ping pong diplomacy. Uh, shall I uh, like recognize? You, 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 oh, all right, you do it. Uh, okay, please I'll identify yourself. Down to the mics, if people huh? will come down to the mics. Okay. 
Uh, identify yourself and ask a very quick question so that we can get real ping pong here. Okay. <clears throat> Let's start right here. Wait, wait. I'm sure there's a... I, I can just speak loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can speak very loud. Right? Um, all right. Um, I'm Ian Chong, a uh, graduate student come from the Venture Servant here. Um, and my, my question for you is, you're basically explaining um, sort of China's fragility by looking at um, you know, what, what the leaders are thinking. Um, and then you sort of aggregate it to regime instability. Now, I'm, I'm wondering why you sort of do that aggregation, because a, just as plausible an explanation could be, well, the leaders themselves are unstable. The ruling coalition may be unstable. You yourself said that, well, you know, they're easily replaceable. So the fight may not be whether the regime stays or not, but just about you know, who comes in power, the sort of fights that you're, you're talking about. Um, and it may sort of play out and look like it's regime instability because the way that particular uh, leaders may want a long roll or build coalitions may be to, you know, to use that kind of a rhetoric. Um, so China, um, you know, going by my logic, may be a lot less stable. I'm uh, sorry, a lot less fragile than you seem to be suggesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm, I'm really um, not, actually there's a lot in the book about the resilience of party rule. You know, so I'm not arguing that they're on the brink of collapse tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> but I don't think it's simply a matter of changing the individual leaders at the top, that they simply worry that they would be defeated by a rival. I think that the focus on preventing social unrest and protest, um, their uh, their fetish for trying to control the content of the media, all that suggests to me that they're worried about society and not just about a challenge from a political rival. Question? Yes. Uh, the second one is very different. Let's let's bracket that, okay? <clears throat> we'll give you some feedback. <clears throat> Somebody knows how to control this thing. Like well, the question of the um, advice to policymakers. There are a number of things in no, number of points in the last chapter. But um, let me mention one, because you might think that the implication is just, oh, make nice to China. Don't, you know, make them feel secure. It's not that. Um, for one thing, I argue that America has to maintain its own military strength in the Pacific. Because when and if China's leaders might be making threats and then fear that they can't back down without provoking domestic um, unrest or domestic protest or um, you know, even being brought down domestically. I want them to look out over the Pacific and see a very robust military presence so they think twice before they make threats and act out. So that's just one example. But there are a number of others there as well. Yes, sir. Professor, as you know, Kim Jong-il's nuclear ambitions can very easily transmit itself over into Japan, becoming a nuclear power, which is not in the best interest of PRC. Why does the PRC allow Kim Jong-il to continue with his nuclear ambitions? Well, I think that uh, China's leaders do not want Kim Jong-il and the North Koreans to have a nuclear capability. If you look at Chinese reactions, uh, well, if you look at all the international reactions after the October 2006 
uh, nuclear weapons test by North Korea. The Chinese one was the strongest criticism of anyone. Now, your question suggests that if they wanted to, they could stop Kim Jong-il from developing nuclear weapons. Um, it's true that North Korea is dependent for its food and fuel and becoming increasingly economically integrated with China. But, um, uh, and so if China actually wanted to just embargo North Korea, maybe they could bring them to their knees. But that would create a regime collapse in North Korea and send uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees over into Northeast China, which is China's rust belt, where there's already quite extensive unemployment and a lot of problems. So again, it comes back to domestic uh, concerns for China. And then finally, I just say that short of actually cutting food and fuel trade with uh, North Korea, simply telling North Korea what to do is not going to get them very far, any more than we can tell our allies what to do. I haven't noticed we're doing so well with Taiwan. I haven't noticed we're even doing that well necessarily in many respects with South Korea. So um, uh, I think Americans assume that China has, that North Korea, Kim Jong-il is kind of just uh, the Chinese are pulling the strings, but it's actually a lot more complicated than that. Yes. Thank you for speaking today. Um, my name is Claire Strauss, and I'm a master's student here. Um, and I work in China with the Chinese Environmental Group. And um, as you probably know, these companies, um, the public sector NGOs in the Chinese Development Group, um, have closed down and shut down by the government. And I'm wondering how best. Well, I think China's leadership is very concerned about its domestic environmental problems because they have passed from being just a health and economic problem to becoming a political problem because of the demonstrations. Um, and so I think the most effective way is really the domestic voices calling for solving these problems. I don't think the international role, it, it, that's secondary. And I'm, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens with environmental NGOs. Seems to me that China's central leaders, their biggest problem is getting local leaders to pay attention to environmental quality and environmental protection. They're struggling to find a way to do that. They need monitoring watchdogs without risking going to full accountability and democracy. So compare NGOs and the media. I think they prefer using watchdog media to NGOs because they have, feel that they have more control over the media, whereas NGOs, they've seen what's happened in other countries where environmental organizations do become the bud of a growing uh, democracy movement. So what you see is a regime that's really very nervous about any organized activity that isn't under the control of the party. Yes, sir. Uh, 
I'm not. These are Chinese students, right? Yeah, because it has been an area that's more open. I mean, there's been more tolerance of activism, uh, organized efforts in this area, just as there's been more tolerance of media oversight in this area. So, but there's, I'm sh there's a tension within the uh, party leadership. On the one hand, they feel the need for this monitoring of local officials and they, you know, want to encourage citizen activism on the environment. On the other hand, they're really worried about losing control of it. Yes? Well, I do, um, I actually think that China's leaders are more worried about inequality than they should be. You know, so I'm, uh, and the only survey data I've seen, actually I haven't seen the actual data, but um, I, one of my colleagues, um, Marty White at Harvard, says that his surveys show that people in China feel they have a lot of opportunity. So um, it shouldn't be really that politically destabilizing. And, um, but China's leaders, they agonize over this publicly, so much so that it's almost become a kind of trope that people have and talk about it in China, whereas it, it just may be exaggerated problem. I agree with that. Um, your other protests uh, involve recognizing the government as legitimate. I don't know about that, but I think um, it's true that most people protesting in China are protesting for very specific reasons. They're not out to try to overturn the government. I, I you know, I agree with you completely about that. Uh, let me go over here. Yes.
Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, of course, America has its own domestic politics. And basically, our human rights policy has been largely about our own domestic politics. Um, and I consider myself a person who cares intensely about the improvement of human rights in China. And I came away from my experience three years in government very pessimistic about the ability of the U.S. government to influence the improvement of human rights in China. Um, it, you know, and if you look at the whole history of our policy, everything we've tried to do, you know, we've tried all sorts of things, setting the bar very low, setting the bar higher, having Congress do it, having the president do it, uh, I mean, it's, I don't think we've really accomplished all that much. I think what really drives changes in human rights practices is domestic demand in China. The only thing that I feel kind of positive about is technical cooperation on rule of law, helping trying to strengthen China's legal system. I think any kind of technical cooperation like that that strengthens the hand of the professionals who themselves are trying to reform China is a good thing. But the megaphone diplomacy, um, I don't know. I mean, it's true that China does care about its international reputation more than almost any other country, so it's susceptible to shaming, which can be a useful thing if you're trying to transform the way a country does something. But on the human rights side, because it comes down to the you know, CCP maintaining its rule, they basically dig in their heels and don't um, cooperate. In fact, you know, I mentioned in the book, if you compare what we were able to accomplish on nonproliferation and trade with what we were able to accomplish on human rights. Those were the three big bilateral issues that we always worked on. China changed its behavior dramatically on nonproliferation and opening up its domestic market. But on human rights, we really didn't get it hardly anywhere. Yes, and back. Well, I want to know what your ideas are. I want to hear your ideas. I think there's kind of an absence of creative thinking about that. Um, you know, I don't, I think the things that help, we're already doing. Um, you know, and we have educational exchanges, we have now more technical cooperation, although the amount of funding that Congress gives for democracy, rule of law types activities in China is just minuscule. I mean, compare it to any Central Asian or Eastern European country, and it's, you know, there's always been a, a feeling among many members of Congress that 
any money spent on, say, training Chinese judges or working with prosecutors and stuff just strengthens party rule rather than helping to reform it. So there's, it's really hard to get support for that. Yes, sir. Well, um, China's central leaders try to protect themselves by identifying with the cause of the protests frequently and um, blaming the local officials. Uh, and uh, then uh, satisfying the demands of the protesters and then throwing the organizers into jail. That's basically the formula. And it's worked pretty well so far in keeping things small scale, but it does sort, certainly create kind of perverse incentives. I mean, you know, uh, the fact that it's not all that coercive in the way it handles protests may just encourage more protests, although you don't want to be the organizer. But nowadays you can organize protests without having the organizer be uh, visible using text messaging, other technologies, and you know, uh, that makes the job of the central government harder. But you have identified, I think, very central question in the study of Chinese politics today, which is this relationship between the central government and local governments and um, uh, you know given that it's a hierarchy and the appointments are made from above they should be able to get these local officials to do more of what they want them to do than they have been so far so that is a great puzzle in Chinese political economy that we're all trying to sort out yes sir Well, uh, the question of food and medicine and toy quality, product quality, is a big domestic issue in China. Even before there was international uproar over it, there has been controversy within China, major complaints about this in China. In fact, I just saw online that Xinhua itself, here's something Xinhua News Agency is now very market-oriented, publishing all sorts of things. They just published a story about how the instances of people dying, more people died from, was it just medicine or medicine and food? I'm not sure, but tainted things in the past year. So this is a major domestic issue in China. Um, and Foreign reaction is really secondary to it, but on the other hand, China's uh, policymakers pay a lot of attention to it, and they're trying to do the best they can to improve the situation, improve the monitoring of production, et cetera, because obviously they're very dependent on trade 
and they are concerned if people don't want to buy Chinese goods. That's a very bad thing for China. So apology. Apology? You know, I don't. I, I, you know, there are lots of conflicts. I don't think the Chinese government. I don't think the Chinese government. Why are we apologizing? We bombed their embassy. Yeah, to me that's a little different. It's a very overt act of aggression. We killed Chinese people. Striking an embassy is, is kind of an act of war. So it seemed like the appropriate thing to do in order to get past it, in order to go back to normal diplomatic relations. So I think it's, to me, it seems very different, those two issues. Yes? The hue and cry, the hue and cry over this, yeah. Well, I think the FDA, you know, I believe that we, here's an area where technical cooperation will pay major benefits to everyone, you know, uh, and I think the Chinese right now, I, I'm not familiar with what's actually going on, but my guess is that there's probably a major effort uh, to cooperate in helping the Chinese improve their own domestic um, supervision of production of medicine and food in particular. And, you know, it's very difficult because there's so many subcontractors and uh, business is not done, you know, in as modern a way, you know, and uh, people are rushing to get into lucrative businesses without licenses, and there's a lot of corruption in getting licenses. So it's a big mess, and it's, it's similar to, uh, of course, China's bigger, and so it's problems and the fallout on us of the problems are bigger. But this is a similar problem that has happened in a lot of other countries that as, uh, at that level of development. You say there are only 15 minutes left. Please do say who you are and I'll ask a quick question. Okay, yes. Loyalty of the military. Giving the military more influence over Chinese foreign policy? Actually, I don't think that's what they've done at all. I think they've professionalized the military so the military has less influence over Chinese foreign policy than it used to. You don't have military leaders in the standing committee of the Politburo anymore. Uh, the People's Liberation Army is basically out of politics, back to the barracks, with all this fancy new equipment that they can enjoy learning how to operate. And that's, that's the formula. It's been quite effective. Yes, sir. Well, of course, this is the issue that could actually spark a military conflict between the United States and China. 
and it's therefore one that's of great importance to U.S. national security. Um, what we have been doing, starting with the uh, Clinton administration and then in the Bush administration as well, is try to encourage the two sides to have a dialogue with one another and stabilize the situation between the two sides. Um, and of course, we have also, and the Bush administration has been much more forthright than the Clinton administration has been at kind of slapping down Taiwan leadership to criticize actions that they have taken that are viewed as provocative, making it very difficult for Beijing not to react in some way. Taking symbolic gestures that will actually not leave the people of Taiwan any better off, but just are a kind of way of uh, inching toward uh, assertion of legal independence for Taiwan. And uh, President Bush really got very ticked off at Taiwan President Chen Shui-bian and publicly criticized this uh, idea of having a referendum in Taiwan uh, and said so publicly standing next to Wen Jiabao, the Chinese premier, when he visited Washington. And since that time, just recently, um, Secretary Rice has also criticized Chen Shui-bian's proposals to hold a referendum at the presidential election this month. So um, I think I have some ideas that are proposed in the book, but I think basically we need to do whatever we can to get the two sides actually to start talking to each other. And uh, that may mean a more active role. I'm not proposing mediation, but a little more forthright role at trying to bring the two sides into dialogue with one another. Yes, sir. Well, these, most of these people are my friends. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're uh, policy advisors who are quite influential in China. You, you'll see a big difference in what they say inside China and what they say to the foreign media. Um, and, you know, they feel, and of course this, Many of the statements they do make to the foreign media do get translated and get to the leadership. Um, but they speak freely, but not entirely freely. They're still careful. A statement that the rise of China is an illusion is completely consistent with government policy. It's consistent with government policy. They want to reduce the threat perceptions of China outside of China. And so, in fact, when they, um, a few years ago, they started talking about peaceful rising, China's peaceful rising. 
which I thought was really welcome candor to, to explicitly acknowledge that China is a rising power that is, could create perceptions of threat from other countries and that China needs to work on that in a way that convinces people that its intentions are benign. So I thought that was a great thing to say, but then people criticized that because they said that it will just reinforce the perception that China is a threat because it's rising. So they changed the terminology to peaceful development. Some people also criticized it because they said um, it will make our threat to use force if Taiwan declares independence less credible because it suggests we'll always be peaceful even if Taiwan declares independence. So the reason I just bring that up is to say that most of the statements by those people are kind of the undertones in Chinese policy, but they're not directly uh, antithetical to government policy. Yes and no. No, they are speaking freely, but they are also aware that whatever they say will be read by the Chinese government, and so they're cautious about what they say. Yes. I think that simply competition for resources is unlikely to stimulate conflict. The way it would work is that the framework that we place on that competition leads us to view China as an enemy. And of course, China would uh, believe that we are willing and potentially uh, might uh, try to strangle China and prevent it from importing the energy it needs to keep its economy going. Now, um, our, as long as we keep this at a commercial level, then it seems to me there's not too much to worry about. But when the United States uh, does treat it as <coughs> a matter of national security the way we did when we prevented the Chinese oil company from buying the American oil company, we provoke the same similar reactions from China. And so my recommendation would be to keep energy issues, commercial issues, to recognize that we can hardly expect China to just stop growing and stop importing energy and just have uh, treated as a commercial matter rather than viewing this as a hostile act to the United States. And, you know, some people may believe that China's economic success in and of itself is a threat to the United States. If they react that way, then it does definitely become a self-fulfilling prophecy and we're really in for trouble. But China is cooperating with Russia and Venezuela and others to uh, acquire land, uh, resource, oil resources, uh, land that may be highly prospective for finding oil. And there's already Well, China is trying to find sources of energy that haven't been wrapped up already by the people who got there first you know, uh, which are mostly the Western oil companies. So they'll go basically anywhere uh, where they can get the energy. It does end up putting them in beds with some bad governments in Africa, Latin America, and you know, that's something that they're feeling the heat 
on, and they are actually trying to find ways of uh, protecting their reputation, which they value highly, this reputation as a responsible power, by um, uh, not endorsing everything those governments are doing and trying to work with the West uh, cooperatively on foreign policy in a way that doesn't create an antagonistic relationship. We only have about five minutes left. Will people who've had their hands up for a long time please wave them more yeah. energetically? Yes, right here. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand you. Wait, the, the threat to China or to us, sir? Threat from China? Well, I think we need to keep a cool head. Um, you know, for example, these stories about energy. I, I was just at Mount Holyoke College. We had a conference, and Ian Johnston was there. And he had a paper, and he did a content analysis of terms like voracious, uh, China's voracious appetite for hunger. What, I forget the words, all these words he used. And he did a content analysis of this, you know, and you can just see these words getting used a lot in our uh, articles on competition for energy with China. Um, you know, that's our media trying to sell newspapers, just like China's media tries to sell newspapers. So there's not a whole lot we can do about it, but I think our, it's important for political leaders and politicians to try to keep a cool head about this and to recognize that um, uh, kind of bashing China really plays well in America and yet it's not it's not a free ride you know uh, those words do resonate inside China and stimulate Chinese domestic politics, which become increasingly hostile to the United States. So I think we should remain strong. I think we need to remain firm on a lot of different issues, including nonproliferation, for example. But I think we have to, uh, at least our leaders, need to watch their words carefully and uh, try, avoid chest thumping uh, which will only be counterproductive. It is six o'clock. Okay, thank you.